particularly nephrologists um, are very much these days into uh, lifestyle modification or rather advising people about lifestyle modification. Is it because of the increase uh, in the instance of uh, uh, kidney diseases or is it because they also being trained in internal medicine that you know they feel that it is better for people to... I, I think uh, nephrologists have a very good knowledge of internal medicine because we deal with a lot of uh, diseases there where internal medicine is needed. And I think we also see a lot of sadness of poor lifestyles. Uh, almost all patients I see have either diabetes, obesity or hypertension. So if I can control these three, then I am uh, redundant. I think if you can control uh, diabetes, overweight or obesity, hypertension, uh, most nephrologists uh, won't see too many patients because they are the number one causes of kidney disease all across the globe. Because we see so much of sadness, I think we are more tuned to lifestyle modifications. And also, I think uh, most of the treatment we give starts off with lifestyle modification well before we start dialysis or transplantation. So I think we are more tuned to advising patients about lifestyle modifications right from the time that we detect that they have kidney disease. But why do uh, people sometimes feel so dejected that there are so many bad examples all around of people having smoked throughout their life or having filled themselves with alcohol, but nothing happens to them and people who actually live such a decent life are the ones who end up with problems. Like my mother was recently asking me about this neighbor who has lung cancer and she's uh, being a woman, I'm sure she's not even gone next to anybody who must have even smoked a cigarette because in a house nobody ever smoked a cigarette and, and the way she's suffering, this is like, you know, people really ask a question about, do I really have to be so careful because if things have to happen, things will happen. And also about cancer recently, there was this report that it could be a case of pure bad luck and nothing else because there is no rule as to who can actually get it. It could just be you being uh, yeah. See, there are unfortunate. Two, two main things to our existence. One is your genes and uh, the genes that you inherit, the genes that get mutated. Second is the environment. We can only modify our environment. We can also make sure that certain things that we do do not mutate our genes. So that's the only part under our control. You cannot uh, change your genetic makeup. Your parents, your grandparents have inherited, and you have inherited from them, that you cannot change. What we can change, we should try to change. And also in medicine, like uh, any other aspect of life, I think we should go by statistics of large number of patients than looking at an individual. If you ask me, you allow 100 people to smoke, another 100 people who don't smoke, Definitely more people in the non-smoking group do better than the smokers. But there may be some smokers who live to be a hundred and don't, don't have a problem. And the truth is also that one cigarette a day is also sufficient to kill you. I think even a cigarette in the room is uh, enough. bad enough. Yeah. Huh? So I, I try very hard not to make friends with people or smokers. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, doctor, because you know, I mean, uh, it's very easy actually being a doctor to say that you don't do it. But there are social compulsions because there may be a lot of people watching this show who also may be thinking that, you know, I mean, it's, it's okay for a doctor to say this, but he doesn't understand that, you know, I mean, sometimes you have to do these things because, because uh, when you uh, progress in life, when you move further, there are some things like... I mean, what do you do with your money anyway? Like, you know, you buy better drinks or you actually eat better or you, you laze around, you, uh, you enjoy. But then they say, if I have to live only to exercise and, you know, diet uh, myself to the tomb. So, I mean, uh, what is the point of living at all? I would rather do all these things and die than... I mean, I'm talking about the philosophy of some, some people. So do you think there should be a combination about, like you talk about moderation, so even about asking people to alter their lifestyles, you should do it in moderation? Uh, I don't see any compulsions in life. Compulsions are man-made or self-made. If I do not want to drink, no one can force me to drink. If I do not want to smoke, no one should be able to make me smoke. Because you have other things to entertain people with. But there no. are some people who can only do the best in terms of giving company. See, watching a movie may be more pleasurable than smoking or drinking. I mean, so you can make your choices. Watching uh, Virat Kohli score a hundred may be more interesting uh, rather than drinking or smoking or getting drunk and uh, sort of abusing your body. But there's also a psychological aspect to it, right, doctor? Because I think that maybe these people need counselling too, not just an advice. 
because I think uh, for people to come out of these, and like you're talking, I mean, it's actually understandable and true that there are so many alternatives, but, but for people to be able to come out, because from Freud's time onwards, like we know about the associations people have with drinking, to smoking, to so many things, and people most often know that it's not okay, but they still do it because of uh, some, See, some think, psychological uh, weakness. Ma many of these things start young in life, uh, many of them start smoking in school, college, and that bothers me. And I think uh, if they can uh, sort of grow to be mature people without starting smoking or drinking, then you have a lot more control over what you do and what you don't do. I mean, smoking, I have absolutely no doubts in my mind. There's no moderation. It's all or none. Either you smoke and die or you don't smoke and live. Uh, the rest of the things, there is some moderation because if you are too rigid, in your lifestyle, some people might not find that pleasurable. They may not want to live a hundred years of extraordinary disciplined life versus seventy years of fun. But it's an individual choice. If you want to live long and healthy, and I would like to emphasize the word healthy, it's not how long you live, it's how healthy you are. And the unfortunate effect of low, most of the lifestyle diseases is that the effects are seen twenty, thirty years from now. See, you may not know today when you're smoking that you'll develop some lung problem, COPD, you can't breathe, you get cancer, you get a heart attack after another 20, 25 years or even earlier. So you don't realize that. You get the pleasure of smoking now, but you get uh, the toxic effects of smoking many years down the line. So what you get today as pleasure would be a curse for you later. So I think that is where counseling is needed. And I think that is what uh, the government is also doing in the tobacco, uh, in the cigarette packs. They give these hideous figures of people having cancer. They're and people don't even look at them. <laughs> yeah. So they buy individual cigarettes. They want cigarettes. to believe that it's not so there. So they want to buy individual cigarettes where the package yeah. is not there. <laughs> so they try to bypass the system. But I think uh, tobacco in any form is a no-no. Everything else, a significant amount of moderation is what is needed. And ultimately, it's your choice. If you want to lead a reckless lifestyle, it's like uh, some people opt for dangerous sports, car racing, uh, doing all kinds of adventurous things, uh, climbing the Himalayas. I mean, they're all dangerous sports. Uh, there is a risk of injury and death, but that's the risk that uh, they're willing to take. Who are we to say no? But if it bothers someone else, I would say no. For instance, public smoking, I would say no, because it's not your uh, body alone. You're also causing damage to someone else who's in the room. If you're a mother and you're smoking, you'll damage your uh, unborn child. So I think uh, issues where the damage can happen to others is something we, the government or one, public needs to regulate. One thing that is uh, very uh, evident, particularly with you, is that you seem to advocate that it's not just about taking care of your body, but also keeping your mind in a healthy manner, that you, the way you conduct yourself, to how you deal with people, to how you control your emotions, to how you be cool, to, I mean, the way you are. So, so, but that's not very easy for a lot of people, but though it's very essential uh, that you, you not just, you know, I mean, uh, ensure that your heart is healthy, but you also need to not allow yourself to be getting agitated quite often or you know the way you react to things and so on which is which like I learned from my grandmother which is more important than perhaps even like your lifestyle I mean like rather your food or your exercise or whatever because my grandmother actually lived to about 92 and she was completely healthy because she never got angry and uh, I've seen a lot of people who are like cool and nice and Nothing happens to them. And there are people who are like, you know, there was an uncle of mine, like, used to get quite agitated, used to be short-tempered, he died at 56. And so I don't know whether there's something like that, but a lot of people who, who are, like, not, not very short-tempered and so on seem to live longer. Is it actually true? Like, for example, that Siddhaganga Swami of uh, uh, Tumkur, who doesn't get agitated or angry or anything at all, and he's living to about uh, 107 years now. Thanks, Deepak, for the compliments. I, I firmly believe, I'm not a guru of any sorts, but I firmly believe you cannot control your mind, you cannot control yourself. Your body is a reflection of what happens in your mind. If your mind wants you to do something, your body does it. I mean, the mind is the ultimate. So if you cannot control your mind, then you have no control over yourself. And there is fairly good evidence that uh, type A personalities, people who react angrily, get upset over small things, 
have a shorter life, uh, life and also more uh, lifestyle diseases than people who uh, are more calm and Any cool. Any kind of correlation between yeah, this? For instance, when you are very upset and angry, you release a, release a lot of uh, hormones in your body, including catecholamines, which makes the platelets sticky and you are more prone to have a stroke, heart attack, so on and so forth. So that those things are well known. But in general, I think the world would be a lot uh, better if most people could control their minds. I think uh, uh, the tongue is the worst weapon. It's probably as bad as a nuclear weapon. And it could also a pierce sharp you. tongue and a uh, tongue that insults or uh, makes others unhappy is something that uh, should be controlled. I have a philosophy that if you want to react in a bad way, if you want to react in a good way, react immediately. But if you're not happy about something that's happening or if you're upset, think over it, don't react. Even if it's uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour or the next day. I've seen most uh, unhappy situations when you react in anger. But uh, it's so difficult to be someone like you. I mean, you're so pleasant and you talk in such a soft and nice manner. But these are also things that come with uh, you as part of your personality. And that's why we have personality types and that's something uh, that you cannot dispute at all. I mean, people cannot be the same at any cost. So, so what do you do? I mean, you're so fortunate that you have such a nice... Uh, uh, Disposition I, I think, and I think the world would have been very boring if everyone was the, of the, had the same personality. But what I am saying is, if your personality is hurting others, try to modify it. I am not saying you have to be extraordinarily pleasant, be a sadguru or whoever you are, and always smile and talk. And that doesn't. I mean, that's good to have that, but it's not necessary. But I, what I am saying is. Do not have a personality which will upset others, insult others, make someone else unhappy. What about sleep, doctor? I strongly believe uh, sleep is a very essential part of life. And I am also going to say something that most people uh, may not readily accept. I think you need to have a sound sleep at night, at least six to eight hours, undisturbed sound sleep, and that leaves you fresh in the day. And I think uh, I am a firm believer, and uh, also there is fairly good evidence to this effect, a nap, a short nap in the afternoon makes you a lot more productive. You keep talking about the Japanese nap, the yeah, hold yeah, a spoon yeah, yeah, and yeah. sleep. A short nap. Not it's sleep actually. actually, and the moment you, you doze to, off, yes. when, the, when the spoon falls yeah. down, you, that you hold wake up. You hold a spoon and the nap, the minute you fall asleep, the spoon will fall down because your muscles relax, that's time to get up. <laughs> I mean, but 15, 20 minutes, a maximum of 30 minutes of nap. Uh, is certainly good for you because but it makes you But unfortunately, a lot of people don't get enough sleep and when they have to be sleeping, they don't sleep. And when they don't want to sleep or when they don't have to sleep, that's when they actually get the best of sleep. So, so and, and people don't want to depend on medication for sleep. Uh, we would never suggest that. And a lot of things don't actually contribute to good sleep. And a lot of people feel so sad about not being able to sleep and that causes a lot of irritation. So do you think that people should uh, somehow pay a lot of attention to good sleep? Uh, they should. Uh, sleep hygiene is probably as important as any other hygiene. And uh, I uh, always say that uh, if you have sleep disturbance, it's like you have a permanent jet lag. You don't sleep at the right time, you sleep at the wrong time. When you travel from the US could also or somewhere affect else. your productivity. Yeah, 100% it product it could, uh, uh, affect your decision-making ability. Yeah, it, it could uh, affect your emotions, relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you haven't rested well, you'll be crabby. Uh, you are not in your full senses. Your decision-making is flawed. You become less productive. So I think uh, good sleep is absolutely necessary for good work. And uh, what about uh, family life? In the sense, not just about being with your uh, children or your wife or whatever, just having a proper family life. Because, you know, you have also seen a lot of people who go through a lot of disturbances in their family also end up having a bad health. I, I think uh, for your peace of mind, you need to have a good family life. And to me, that's of utmost importance. I wouldn't uh, sacrifice that for anything. My Sundays are sacrosanct with the family and it doesn't necessarily mean wife and children, it's a family, whoever you consider as family, a family vacation together. I think you need to have someone that you can confide in and you're comfortable with. It may be your close family, it may be a close circle of friends, but you have to have someone that you can confide in and uh, it is very important that you have a, a number of members within the family or within a close circle of friends 
who will give you all the support that's needed when you're in trouble. When you're happy and uh, flying high, you don't need any support. It's only when uh, there's a wreckage, you need support. And unless you build it across the time, no one will come to pacify you when you're in trouble. So that relationship has to be built over decades. It can't happen overnight. Doctor, a lot of people are more terrified by the idea of bad health or falling ill than actually falling ill. And you always try to pacify people by telling them the problem may not be as big as it seems to be. Uh, that's a very nice way of making somebody feel nice about it or getting somebody to prepare himself or herself to get through the process of uh, healing themselves. But uh, do you think that's more important than, uh, than actually going through the process of uh, getting treated or getting diagnosed or knowing about what problem you have? You could be having a very big problem, but the doctor should be the first one not to intimidate or not to scare. And when you scare somebody, half the problem becomes the whole problem. No, I think this is, uh, you have hit the nail on the head. In fact, I believe uh, communication skills are probably a very essential tool in, in uh, the medical profession and so also in other professions. And in fact, we have now uh, started uh, communication skills for medical students at Manipal University, which I'm affiliated with. And uh, I think uh, the doctor should have a way of breaking bad news. You should not intimidate or scare the patient and the relative. I'll give you an example. My niece had to have a surgery uh, in the U.S. when I was living in the U.S. So she came to one of the best doctors uh, in the country. And uh, before the surgery, they're quite impersonal, some of the doctors. They rattle out all the complications. And she said, death is a complication. I mean, she came for what was a relatively minor surgery. And the minute he said, death is a possibility, she ran out of the room. And she came out to me crying, saying, I don't want it. He says, I could die. So what he said is, there is a 1 in 10,000 chance of her dying. But the way you put it, so what I would have done, or what most people would have done is saying, uh, so this is a surgery, which is relatively minor surgery, but uh, any surgery has to be taken seriously. There could be some complications. And then uh, we could uh, tell them the risk of complications. And they should be uh, sort of explained in a simple layman's term. When I tell someone there's a very remote chance of death, I'll tell them, you're at Manipal Hospital, you want to cross to the Leela, which is right across. Your chance of being hit by a car is more than your chance of dying during surgery, <laughs> which is true. Yeah. Because if it's one in 10,000, that means you cross that road 10,000 times, you'll definitely get hit by someone. <laughs> so I think there's a way of putting things. I don't want to be dishonest. I think patients need to know their complications, but not to be intimidated, scared that they'll run away from the procedure. <laughs>